when I faced the scene the first day, it looked like something out of the apocalypse. The long road to recovery begins in Jersey Shore towns hit hard by Sandy. The president of AT&T Mid-Atlantic explains why the Superstorm wiped out cell phone service for more than two million customers. And a chef from the Jersey Shore provides nourishment and hope for people affected by the storm. It's all ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSE&G, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From our satellite bureaus, our partners in newsrooms and on college campuses across the state, and from the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello and welcome to NJ Today. I'm Desiree Taylor. Mike Schneider is off. Well, it's the most wonderful time of the year for merchants. Black Friday, the start of the busy holiday shopping season, actually kicked off last night for a host of big chain retailers. Crowds were at the Deptford Mall late last night, eager to grab bargains and check off a few items on their Christmas gift list. Retailers are hoping this shopping frenzy continues and adds up to a very merry holiday shopping season. Early indicators are showing that shoppers are spending more freely this year. But life still isn't back to normal for areas of the state hit hard by Superstorm Sandy. The devastation to some Jersey Shore towns has been widely reported, but not so much in others. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, has the story. The sign says Highlands, where the Jersey Shore begins. Highlands also has lowlands that hug Sandy Hook Bay, and they got drenched, especially in the neighborhood around one particular street. The name of the street is Cheerful Place, and although it's tempting to say Cheerful Place isn't so cheerful anymore, people we spoke to here today are in pretty good spirits, given how hard hit this part of the state has been. Tracy Moser lives on Cheerful Place with her parents and brother. Their house was ruined. It's hard to go through your room and everything and take everything out, and it's all ruined. I even lost like my high school stuff and everything. I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. Neil Chrysler has lived here all his life and saw his house inundated. We stormproofed as much as we could, and we had no idea we'd be four foot deep in the house. That was uh, a little bit of a surprise, but um, we're, we're slowly getting by, and uh, we're going to move forward, and everybody's been great. The town's been great. The neighbors has been great. I love the shore, and I love... I love this community and I think we're only stronger because of it. Everyone's been out helping each other and it's been a really nice, for a bad, for a bad event, it's been a nice outcome. See my outside light over there? Yeah. There's a line on it, that's up on the lens. Yeah. That's how high the water was. Wow. And like I said, I, I've lived here all my life, uh, 66 years, and uh, the water came in the house one other time in Hurricane Donna about two inches. The next town south, Seabright, got smacked even harder. Sightseers are causing traffic jams. To see things like the Driftwood Cabana Club, a big building knocked completely on its side, Mayor Dina Long says the media were slow to grasp it. Well, when the waters first pulled back from Sandy, um, the town was basically inaccessible. And so members of the media were not really able to come in and see for themselves what had happened. When I faced the scene the first day, it looked like something out of the apocalypse. She and a councilman spoke to us at the firehouse where food is being prepared and given out every day. We lost our business district, so there's no place to go when you need something to eat. And so it's really been tremendous for our productivity and uh, good in keeping the spirits of the community high. They had where we're standing now, uh, the day after the storm, we had five feet of sand up to, up to my neck, sand as far as the eye could see here. Assemblyman Declan O'Scanlan sees silver linings now. I mean, you always hope 
that your community uh, has the character to stand together and to rise above adversity and, and, and stick together. You don't know though until you're tested. These folks have been tested now uh, and passed it. And today, now every day, they continue to pass that test. The malls may be packed a few miles away, but there is no Black Friday here. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron in Seabright. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is planning to update flood zone maps for many shore towns. The revised maps, some of which haven't been updated in decades, could mean that some residents will be required to buy flood insurance. Many coastal communities are still recovering from the flooding caused by Sandy's storm surge a few weeks ago. FEMA says the new maps should be ready by next summer. The search continues for the owner of a boat that washed up on a busy walkway in Hudson County that tops tonight's Garden State Express. We begin in Hoboken, where this sailing yacht still sits just north of 15th Street several weeks after Superstorm Sandy. So far, attempts by Hoboken police to contact the owner have been unsuccessful. If the owner isn't found soon, the boat may be sold through an auction. Our next stop is Seaside Heights, where officials are considering the fate of a popular roller coaster that was knocked off Casino Pier during the storm. The mayor tells NBC TV the coaster may remain in the Atlantic Ocean as a tourist attraction if the Coast Guard determines it's stable. And our final stop is Clementon, where that shaking feeling some Camden County residents reported turned out to be an earthquake. The 2.1 magnitude quake rattled parts of South Jersey just after midnight. No injuries have been reported. And that's your Garden State Express for Friday, November 23rd. More women than ever before will be sworn into Congress this January. Female candidates broke other barriers on Election Day earlier this month. But these gains may not be enough to dramatically reshape policies that affect women, says Tali Mendel Mendelberg. The award-winning author and Princeton University Associate Professor of Politics joins me now to explain why. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So this is very interesting. Uh, so we have a record number of women in Congress. Uh -huh. um, exactly how many and why do you think it's not going to have a huge impact? Well, I think what people are focusing on most of all is this 20, um, the number 20, which is the you know record number of women in the Senate. And I think there, there are reasons to, to celebrate this landmark number. But our research suggests that 20 out of 100 is just not going to be enough to really make up um, you know, women's full representation. Uh, because when we conducted our study, which was based on 94 decision-making groups, we found that at 20%, women just were not able to speak up. Uh, they spoke at 60% of the time that men spoke. And they were not able to articulate the preferences that we know ahead of time uh, they, they have. Um, so that's our concern. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it because of how women perceive themselves? Do we not see us, ourselves as leaders, or do we not get the support we need to be leaders? I think it's both. And both are really crucial factors. And so studies have suggested over a long period of time that women are socialized to have less confidence in their abilities, and that is true of women at all levels of ability, and even ambitious women who go into politics tend to have just less, uh, relative to comparable men, uh, less sense that they should be speaking up and they should be articulating their particular interests and preferences. Um, and uh, if you look at biographies, for example, uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, you think here's a confident woman, um, and so she must not have these difficulties. And yet she talks about how when she first started attending meetings, primarily surrounded by men, uh, it took her a while to kind of figure out that she did have something important to contribute to the conversation. And sometimes she would hear a man saying the same thing she was thinking about and just not quite getting around to articulate. And it was a process even for someone like Madeleine Albright. That's amazing. Um, let's talk about um, also uh, why this is happening um, and why it's important that women have a voice. Is that because women tend to speak for vulnerable populations? Yes, it is. And again, a variety of studies have found that even once you control on political ideology and partisan affiliation, uh, women do tend to have a preference, although a slight preference, uh, for taking care of people who need to be taken care of. Children, families, 
single mothers, um, people who are low income, who are disabled and sick. And so what our concern is if women do not speak up as much as men do, um, and if they get cut off or rudely interrupted, which is another pattern we found in these 20% female groups, uh, which has also been found in Senate testimony. Um, so if women are cut off more than men are, if they don't speak as much as men do, then the, the problem is that, that this voice of care for the vulnerable segments in society is going to be underrepresented. And so we really need women to be kind of at parity in terms of the numbers for a full range of perspectives to be heard. So strength in numbers obviously exactly. matters here. Exactly. But uh, again, with these significant gains, uh, with a record number of women in Congress, do you expect that they will um, be able to address some of these issues? Well, I think women do have some say in whether they speak up or not. Uh, so we hope that this is an empowering message for the women who are in place. That is, um, once women are aware that this is the dynamic that tends to happen, um, they can then do something to break that pattern. So, so there is an empowering message here. And our research also finds that um, these problems with women's representation tend to come about when there is majority rule. And so we've articulated a number of reforms or procedures that groups can adopt. For example, if a group uses consensus decision making, um, these problems with women's representation tend to disappear or, or dissipate at least. So we think that this, this is a hopeful message that women can do something here and also that groups can use decision making procedures and more inclusive discussion procedures. And it to, should start early, I imagine. And it yes, should start, start early. with our children, yes, to teach Absolutely. them to be leaders. Absolutely. I think that um, parents and teachers can empower girls at a young age and uh, we have in classroom settings in voluntary organizations extracurricular clubs we have a great opportunity to essentially have a school uh, for democracy for women as well as men ah, um, yeah. and really teach women to to speak up for themselves ah, great research such an interesting topic thanks so much for joining thank us thank you very much in the wake of Sandy, the Federal Communications Commission is examining the storm's impact on our communications infrastructure. Millions of people lost cell phone service for days following the superstorm. Mike Schreeder, president of AT&T Mid-Atlantic, talked about the storm damage and lessons learned during an interview with our managing editor, Mike Schneider. Well, it's kind of amazing. When we, uh, we looked at the, uh, the number of people that were affected by this, it certainly is the largest outage of electrical customers in the history of this country. And what it did here in New Jersey in particular that I focused on, it was about 2.7 million customers that lost, uh, lost power and therefore uh, we lost power going into our, a number of our cell towers. We were probably out for, uh, as a network for about four or five days. Uh, it impacted our buildings in New Jersey. Uh, we have enormous backup. Uh, for the Global Network Operations Center, which is in Bedminster, that runs the nationwide and worldwide network. So that was up and running. We were able to restore most power to those buildings within four days. Most of our customers within a week. Uh, we're now pretty certain that we're back to business as usual, that it's all been taken care of. What will you do? What lessons were learned? What will you do differently, if anything? Well, I think that, you know, regrettably, we've had, uh, this is the second run of this in a little over a year. And I think that we've done a number of things over that period of time to improve, and we still want to work on that. Some have said, I mean, that one of your competitors perhaps was a little more aggressive about how, having battery backups on some of their towers. Is that something that, that makes sense to you in going down the road? I, I will say this. I, I think I know who you refer to as one of our competitors. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say that when we looked at the uh, results that we were, in fact, as up to date as they were at that time. I think the reports that came into us indicate uh, that that was the case. As a private entity, we are the first private company that's ever been certified for uh, disaster preparedness by the Homeland Security Department. What we've done is we now have 10 uh, cell site uh, staging, staging areas uh, uh, to bring power in. Uh, we brought thousands of generators in ahead of time. Uh, we located those where we could. Uh, what we also learned is that it was, we had a number of things that we needed to preserve as well as try and restore. Uh, as an example, Mike, the, uh, the worldwide cables, submarine cables, mm -hmm. uh, come in on Long Beach Island. 
Mm. Uh, we were concerned, uh, and our engineers were, that those had been exposed with the erosion that had taken place. And when there was the curfew and the lack of uh, ability to get into those areas, uh, we were concerned that cleanup air you know, cleanup operations in some way might affect that as well. How did so, it work out? Okay. Well, the, the Ocean County uh, and Monmouth County in particular, the, the local officials were very helpful. They allowed us to take teams in there. We staked them out. They were there for days. Uh, but we were able to keep that up and going. The, the notion of communications being as vital as it is nowadays makes it, I guess, when you're out an hour, it's maddening to customers. When, when you're out a week, it must be uh, it takes you into a whole different level of, of experience. Having gone through this twice in the last year myself, not even living in New Jersey, but going through the same thing in, in eastern Pennsylvania, I know that it is. Uh, my, our landline phone went down because most people have. We have wireless phones now. The electric mm -hmm. goes out. That's, that happens as well. So I think our real... And AT&T is in, in the middle of a big, big investment in switching a lot from the old copper lines to the well, fiber optic. Correct. Will that impact well, the survivability of systems? Well, here in New Jersey, that won't impact us because we're not the wireline company. Mm -hmm. uh, but in other places, what we need to do is to show that the reliability is there. And I think that the concern that we have, and we need to sit down, uh, I know that the, F the FCC is looking at this, uh, but we're going to need to look at the, the options in terms of our electric grid and seeing that, that that's up and running. But again, you know, this is something I don't think we could have ever prepared for, for the magnitude of this. You have, an, uh, on a humanitarian level, though, you, the company stepped up big time. Well, what we did is the First Lady, Mrs. Christie, uh, was in touch with me on Saturday and said that she and the governor were proposing a, a, a new fund for uh, rebuilding New Jersey. Uh, we stepped up to that. We made a commitment of $1 million to them. Uh, there's a similar uh, fund that was set up by Governor Cuomo in New York. We also committed to that. Uh, it, we probably did about another million dollars on top of that with the Red Cross nationally, with the food banks in South Jersey. And our employees uh, contributed uh, as individuals almost another $350,000. And last Thursday, we had a day of caring. We had almost 1,000 people in the New York, New Jersey area, employees from as far away as Massachusetts, who came in, uh, worked at food banks, uh, worked with some demolition sites for homes that had to come down. And I think the thing that's truly remarkable is we had thousands of our own employees here that were impacted by this right. and without power and were willing to go out and work on behalf of their neighbors and see that things were restored for them as well. A great response, and let's hope we never have to go through that again. I would hope that would be the case as well. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Mike. He took on the mob and a host of corrupt, powerful government officials and even helped catch the men who assassinated civil rights leader Malcolm X. I'm talking about Herbert Stern, a former federal judge and one of New Jersey's most famous prosecutors. He's written a book called Diary of a DA. He joined me recently to talk about it and his amazing career. Well, it really wasn't very hard because New Jersey at the time was well stocked with corrupt mayors, corrupt mm -hmm. public officials, corrupt people in governor's offices. It was a it was an open joke. Um, this um, uh, time, this era of corruption, um, you were taking on the mob and powerful government officials. Did you make enemies? You must have. Did you have any support? Well, the public seemed to like it. And folks in your field, you know, the, uh, the journalists very much supported us. They, were, they and Senator Case, who was the um, sen senior senator at the time, he was the one that selected us, and he was the one that insisted that we do it. They were our only friends. I would say the public, the press, and that senator. But you know, the press and the public are very powerful friends, and politicians tend to listen when they speak. Tell us um, how intense was this corruption, the ties? It was not just um, uh, there were mob ties with political officials. Yes. And give me some examples. You, you talk about it quite a bit. Well, in the city of Newark was dominated by the mafia. We didn't hesitate to call it the mafia in those days. Um, and the FBI had been uh, Ill illegally listening in on them. And so we had all these tape recordings. They actually made uh, Hugh Adnizio, the mayor of Newark, 
Jersey City and uh, Hudson County was in the grip of uh, not the mob there. It was the politicians dating back to Boss Haig. The, the current boss at our time was Boss Kenny. And the, the amounts of money were really staggering. If you, you, you have to remember that this went back to the early 60s. We found a joint bank account with the, between the mayor of Jersey City and the present city council of Jersey City with $1,231,000 in it. Now, that was an awful lot of money. It's an awful lot of money today, even more then. Uh, the boss Kenny gave $700,000 in cash to his grandchildren. Hmm. So the money was staggering. No one seemed to care about it. But we, we were fishing in a well-stocked pond. <laughs> you prosecuted the real-life Tony Soprano? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Tony Boy Boyardo was his name. Um, his father's nickname was The Boot. His father had an estate in Livingston with an incinerator, and they burned the bodies in it. And we had the actual uh, tape recordings of them discussing, you know, the bodies and which bodies they burned and all of that. Uh, one of your most fa famous cases, uh, it involved a hijacked plane from West Berlin to East Berlin. Yes. Tell me about that one. Well, that one I was a judge, you know, I was in Berlin. And uh, <clears throat> they set up an occupation court. People don't realize it, but the court in Guantanamo today is exactly the same kind of court. As a matter of fact, the court I sat in was the last time such a court had sat until Guantanamo. Uh, the Germans didn't want to prosecute because at that time the wall was up. And these folks, you know, had diverted the plane to escape. And the funny thing was half the passengers immediately defected when the plane landed. So the, the uh, West German government, uh, Berlin was still in occupation status. So the West German government asked the Americans to convene an occupation court and to establish the United States Court for Berlin. And the uh, State Department looked around for the dumbest judge they could find and selected me. Oh, I don't know about that, but that became a movie as well, yes? It became a movie. Judge Stern, fascinating, wonderful book, Diary of, a, Diary of a DA. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And finally tonight, a chef with a big heart and a goal to help people in need spent the Thanksgiving holiday doing what he does best, cooking and serving up a feast to Ocean County residents affected by Superstorm Sandy. Our Lauren Wonko has this heartwarming story. Chef Jason Russo spent this Thanksgiving morning preparing 100 pounds of stuffing, 12 trays of stuffed pork medallions, and sweet potatoes topped with just the right amount of marshmallows. The sous chef mashed 150 pounds of potatoes, and the culinary team carved 40 turkeys. It's all for strangers, anyone displaced by the storm and in need of a Thanksgiving meal. You know, I, I grew up right on the beach. I had a lot of friends that I wish I could be out there helping them, and I couldn't. And it hit me. I'm like, well, I'm helping my own way. You know, this is our trade as chefs. And uh, I just put two and two together. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people that need meals. There's a lot of people that are going to want to feel at home. Russo, the executive chef at the Ramada Inn in Tom's River, says everything was donated, from the dinner rolls to the turkeys. I mean, to, I guess to a fault, I'm a little cynical, or I was a little cynical, just about society today. and people's values and whatnot. And when I started this, the outpouring of support, whether it be from the guys right here giving me a hand to my boss for letting me use the kitchen, to the purveyors for giving the food, to total strangers calling up strangers from across the country, it's the silver lining of obviously a dark, dark cloud. A small team of volunteers assembled at the chef's kitchen this morning to load a U-Haul with dozens of food trays. They drove to the Ocean County College. Russo worked nonstop for the past two weeks for this moment. Folks sit side by side to have a Thanksgiving meal. For many families, it's the first hot meal they've enjoyed together since Sandy hit. A reminder that through all this damage and destruction, there are still so many people in this state who are determined to give back. FEMA worker Alan Mathis is from New Orleans. He's been in New Jersey since November 1st. It's wonderful, number one, and we had certain things like that because I was on the receiving end during Katrina. So I can appreciate what they're going through and what they will go through over the next few months. Alan Gashler is used to hosting Thanksgiving for the family at his home. My daughter's house got flooded, my son's house got flooded, and our house got flooded. So it's uh, 0 for 3 with Sandy. But Gashler says this Thanksgiving, they're grateful for each other. 
and all those who are giving back. The reputation of Jerseyans uh, that's been portrayed in the, in the media is, is so far from the truth. The people, that, they just reach out to help everybody. Obviously, a lot of these guests of ours are going to be wishing they were at their Thanksgiving table in the warmth of their own homes. Um, it's not going to be ideal situation, but at the same time, I think as much as it's going to be memorable for a lot of the wrong reasons, it's going to also hopefully hold a special place in their hearts and be memorable for a couple of the right reasons. For NJ Today, I'm Lauren Wonko in Tom's River. Well, that does it for us. Congressman Albi Osiris joins us Monday. Please join us on Monday when Mike Schneider will return. I'm Desiree Taylor. Have a good night. The New Jersey Association of Realtors knows that owning a home can be your most valuable asset. That's why we take pride in working diligently to protect its value. We know that real estate helps to fuel the engines of our local, state, and national economies. From protecting consumers' interests in our state's capital to working in various neighborhoods throughout New Jersey, our more than 40,000 realtors are dedicated to the communities in which they live and serve. More about us is online at njar.com.